morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bradenton City Council meeting, Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, at 8.30 a.m. in City Hall Council Chambers. Um, today, I would like to do a special thing, and we've done it a few times since I've been mayor, and I know it had been done in the past, but to introduce our mayor for a day, Connor Longo with St. Joseph's Catholic School. He's a seventh grader there, and his interest, we're going to go through some interests because they're very interesting. Uh, he loves singing, playing the piano, acting, and basketball. Um, he is in something special to all of us up here, and I know a lot of people in the audience. He's the president of the Kiwanis Builders Club at St. Joseph's, oh. so that's something very special. And then he's also um, St. Joseph's Thespians Group, which is acting and doing things of that nature. So. Welcome, Connor, and we appreciate you being here. And um, what we'll do at this time, we're going to have our pastor come up, do the invocation, and then Connor will lead us in the pledge. So we'll ask Pastor Dylan Kern with Braden Christian Reformed Church to come forward and take care of the invocation, and then Connor will lead us in the pledge. Everyone, please stand. Good morning, counselors and Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Bow your heads with me this morning. Father in heaven, this morning I bring these civil servants before you as they prepare to serve in the calling that you have set before them. These men and women have devoted themselves to the service of the city of Bradenton to do the best in their power to seek righteousness, uphold justice, and to serve for the greater good of all the people who live under their stewardship. Father, I thank you for the common grace that you supply to all of your creatures so that they can capably do good and useful things. Even in unbelief, you use your instruments to your ends for the good of your creatures. Yet, Father, we all know in our hearts the ready temptations of sin, especially sins related to power. Believing ourselves to be serving the best interests of the least of these, we often are tempted to use ungodly means to manipulate one another and to control what should be a democratic process. Believing our causes to be just and right, we don't consider the means by which we pursue our ends. Unwilling to submit to the body of men and women we have agreed to work together with, we lament and complain when decisions don't go our way. And so, Father, I pray that you would give these men and women a spirit of humility, that they remember that they are servants, not leaders, representatives, not change agents. As they deliberate and vote, place the citizens of Bradenton in the fore of their minds. Tear their hearts away from all self-interest, that they would be at the beck and call of those they have committed to serve. Even on matters that are mundane with no significant moral consequence, I pray that in humility they would set others before themselves, recognizing that no one in this room has all the right answers, and that, whether Republican or Democrat, they need each other. Father, you know far better than we do that none of us are righteous here on earth. Every one of us left to our own devices is completely wicked, unable to so much as desire what is good, let alone pursue it. Even our abilities are weak, tainted by the curse that we brought into this world when we sinned. And so I thank you that in a limited way, this is well understood well enough by our city councilors that they request ministers to pray for their meetings. Father, may your Holy Spirit restrain this sin and strengthen the hands of all in this room. May their work reflect the glory and beauty of Christ, the creator and king of all that was, is, and is to come. May their work serve no obstacle to the faithful proclamation of your gospel in the city of Bradenton, even as they seek the good of all of its citizens, believing or no. I pray this in the name of Christ Jesus the Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, <coughs> one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Absolutely. So, to the right. And then if you can start us in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And at this time, we'll call the meeting to order. Thank you. Madam Clerk. The first item on the agenda this morning is a proclamation, which I'll read on behalf of the mayor. Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas Florida's future prosperity depends on nurturing the healthy development of over 4 million children currently living, growing, and learning within our many diverse communities. And whereas child abuse is a crime against humanity that affects 5,301 children annually in Manatee County, 
with a rate of 60.3 reports per 10,000 in comparison to 51.1 per 10,000 statewide. And whereas child abuse and neglect can cause severe, costly, and lifelong problems among society and victims, such as social, criminal, and academic difficulties, and emotional, physical, and mental health changes. And whereas research shows parents and caregivers who have social networks can seek support in times of need are more resilient, less isolated, and better able to provide safe environments and nurturing experiences for their children. And whereas individuals, businesses, schools, community, and faith-based organizations must make children a top priority and take action to support the physical, social, emotional, academic, and mental development and well-being of all children. And whereas during the month of April, Prevent Child Abuse in Manatee County in collaboration with the Florida Department of Children and Families, Manatee County Sheriff's Office, Bradenton Police Department, Manatee Children's Services, Healthy Start, Safe Children's Coalition, Pinwheels for Prevention, and all agencies dedicated to the well-being of children and families will be engaging in a coordinated effort to prevent child abuse and neglect by promoting awareness of healthy child development, positive parenting practices, and promoting healthy family relationships within our communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention Month and urge all citizens to engage in activities whose purpose is to strengthen families and communities. Signed, Jean Brown Mayor. Thank you. Who's here to accept this? Bring the whole group up. I know sometimes people like to stay in the seats, but we want everybody. I just, I'm Kimberly Griffin. I'm the supervisor for the child protection team, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for promoting and, and helping us continue to prevent child abuse. Thank you. So, any comments from the council? Anybody want to say anything? Vice Mayor Barnaby. The work that you all do is hard, draining. Many times there's not the outcome that you want, but you show up and you keep working and that makes you heroes to me. It takes a village as you can, all of you, all of us, thank you. Yeah. And I think also one of the things I'd like to say is, is obviously thank you and, and it's not eight to five a lot of times and when you look at things and look at other things that may be happening in our country where children are coming in maybe not in the right way and, and getting abused in different ways. So that's something important. I know that I don't want to get too federally involved in conversation, but, but that is something that's happening a lot more and more with children, and we've got to make sure that that gets stopped and, and work towards that. So I think that's very important that what you guys do and see and, and uh, really take care of is something that's, you know, very important because we know that the children may be a smaller percent of our population, but they're 100% of our future. So how do we to continue to, to make them have a quality and productive life? So we, we appreciate it. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. Thank Can you. we get a picture? I mean, everybody, I don't know if we all want to stand up here and then you guys come up a little bit and get the picture with everybody. Thank you for coming and keep up the great work. <coughs> All right, Madam Clerk. The next item on the agenda is a presentation, a water quality update on Sarasota Bay by Dr. David Tomasco. 
Welcome, sir. Uh, hi. Good morning, and okay. I need to get to the mouse to click on the presentation, I think. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Uh, I don't know if I can do it. There you go. <laughs> so it's idiot proof. It's in a secret. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Dave Tomasco. I'm the director of the uh, Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. And uh, I'm here today not to talk about a, a single uh, topic, which is what I was here last time talking about, but the overall health of uh, Sarasota Bay and to answer any questions you might have at the end of this presentation. So we start off with uh, Sarasota Bay. And we're one of 28 national estuary programs throughout the country. And the first thing when we start talking about the health of the bays, we don't talk about water chemistry right away. We talk about like the, the way the people experience the bay. So uh, this is what people like to do in Sarasota Bay. They like to go out on a weekend and with their boat and toss out their anchor and stand around in waist deep water and they wanna see their feet. And uh, so our number one goal is water clarity. And that's because it encompasses an awful lot of good environmental features, but it's also important for quality of life. Healthy Bay is also important for our economy. We have 20,000 jobs that are associated with water-related activities in our region. So we have the commercial fishing village of Cortez. There's not many of them left in Florida, but we have one right here. And we have recreational fishing guides and waiters and waitresses and bartenders and restaurant owners and people right now jet skis and parasailing. So that's a lot of people that have an employment uh, associated with the water. And there's also a property value uplift associated with proximity to the bay. So. Uh, at least one of you is a real estate agent. And, you know, so people pay more to live on the water than a block away or a street away. And so we quantified that back in 2017. And if we adjust it uh, for inflation, it's probably about $4 billion property value uplift associated with proximity of the bay. So we want people to want to continue to live on the water because we need that uh, property tax to pay for police and fire and schools and Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. Um, and we know that property values are reduced by about 20 to 30 percent during a red tide compared to coastal counties that aren't experiencing a red tide. So, you know, that actually, if you sell a house for like, you know, uh, three million, not four million dollars, I don't feel that bad for that person, but that's a property value hit that's going to last as long as that person owns that house. Uh, and then we have a lot of habitats. We want to make sure people understand. We use seagrass as sort of like the canary in the coal mine, sort of a, it's an indicator of the overall health of the system. And so we want to make sure people understand what seagrass is. So it's the stuff that grows underwater in the bottom of the bay. It's not sea oats that grow in the sand dunes and it's not salt marsh. And so it provides a lot of habitat values. As you can see here, this school of fish swimming through the um, seagrass meadows and mangroves there. We have a lot of wildlife that's dependent upon habitats that are dependent upon good water quality. So in the last three years, we've lost about 20 to 30% of our manatee population statewide. It's about 50% on the East Coast. This picture is like, you know, the cutest thing in the world, people bottle feeding baby do uh, manatees. But the reason why they're being baby uh, bottle fed is because their mom starved to death because of a lack of seagrasses as a food source in the Indian River Lagoon because of degraded water quality. So if we don't want that to happen uh, to us here, we don't want to have emaciated and dead manatees washing up against our beaches, then we need to do a better job than they have over there. So we're all about nitrogen management. And so the thing that matters for water quality more than anything else in our region is nitrogen. So if you want your lawn to look green, add nitrogen. If you want your citrus tree to grow faster, add nitrogen. If you want your bay to look green and you want algae blooms, including red tide, to grow faster, add nitrogen, but you don't want that. So we're all about managing nutrient loads. So the only thing you have to measure uh, for coming up with a report card for a place like Sarasota Bay uh, is this, managing the water quality. But there's more to uh, the health of the bay than just the water quality. So all these things are measured. So we actually work with Mantee County and Sarasota County and the Water Management District and Fish and Wildlife to actually collect information on the seagrass meadows. They're mapped every two years. We use volunteers to measure how much macroalgae is on the bottom of the bay. Uh, Mantee County collects water quality. Sarasota County working with Moat collects water quality. FWC collects uh, fish abundance. We put it all together and we come up with a report card. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, the report card. How is the bay doing? And uh, so our report card has four things in there. Two of them are water chemistry, the nitrogen concentration and how much algae is in the water, how much seagrass you have, and how much macroalgae you have. So four things in there. 
And then we take those values and we, we don't compare base segments against each other. We compare each base segment against what it was like during what we call the reference period, 2006 to 2012. We don't know what Sarasota Bay was like 100 years ago. We don't know what it was like 50 years ago. Uh, but we do know that 2006 to 2012, it was a healthy system. We had lower levels of nutrients in the water. We had less algae. We had a 28% increase in seagrass. And you just don't have that if you're anything but a healthy system. So that's our goal, 2006, 2012. We take our results and we color code them. Blues and greens represent good conditions. Yellow is caution. Red is like stop, something's going wrong. So let's see how we come up. <coughs> and I apologize, I have one more year here, 2023. Since when I put this in, I didn't have the 2023 data, but now I do. So I'll talk to you a little bit. But the general thing is the blues and greens that we have during the reference period, this was a healthier system. Uh, and then we have this next seven years, which we call the degraded period. So notice Palmasola Bay, it continues in the blue. So Palmasola Bay continues to be roughly as healthy as it was back then, uh, still. And the upper part of the bay uh, hit a bad spot in 2018. That was when we had that big red tide. That was one single bad year, but that was enough to kill probably about 90% of the fish in the upper part of Sarasota Bay. We lost 1,000 acres of seagrass. So an acre of seagrass might hold like something like 50 million fish. So when you lose 1,000 acres, you, lo you have a huge hit to your fish populations. Uh, the lower part of the bay shifts into the degraded range back in 2013. So something weird is going on in the lower part of the bay. And what happened down there is not happening here, but what happened down there can be illustrative to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future in this part of the bay. So our worst water quality 2018, 2019, that was the worst red tide we'd had in a long time. It was also the worst year that we've had in decades in terms of wastewater overflows, which is kind of the theme here and how they need to be brought under control. Uh, the last couple of years have been improving trends and 2023 is better still. So Little Sarasota Bay switches from yellow to green in 2023 and Palmasola Bay goes down a little bit, but it still stays in the blue. But all the bay, if I had the 2023 line here would be blue and then greens across the board for the other four segments. So uh, why did it switch from healthy to that yellow that we have in 2013? Well, our pollutant loading model says that we had a 20% increase in nitrogen loads. So we set a goal back in 2021 to reduce our nitrogen loads by 20%. And how do we do that? Well, our biggest issue is wastewater. And our wastewater problems that we had in the lower part of the bay were over application of reclaimed water from non-AWT plants. You have an AWT wastewater treatment plant, advanced wastewater treatment. Uh, when it's operating the way it's supposed to, then you can do a surface discharge. You're allowed to under state law. Your permit might not allow it, but under state law you can. That's what the city of Tampa does every single day. But my understanding is you basically have effectively no daily surface water discharge. You may have one during spills, but you have AWT and no surface discharge, which is basically better than what they have in Clearwater and uh, St. Pete <coughs> and Tampa. So you should be proud of that system. Um, but in the southern part of our county, there were no AWT plants south of the city of Sarasota. So Sarasota County didn't have any of these and they had high nutrient water and we had spills and over application of reclaimed water, uh, which was more than 12 tons. So the good news is because we've been talking about this for years, a couple of years, they've actually done the things that are necessary to bring their water quality under control. So we have already met, we believe our pollutant load reduction target. So now the neat part is rather than having to drag people to do the right thing, it's like, did it work? And the answer is, yeah, we've got a lot of good news, particularly in the southern part of the bay. So um, we are unique here, but no part of the open waters of Sarasota Bay are declared uh, impaired for nutrients as per DEP. So we've been talking about this for a while. DEP verified this. So um, Palmasola Bay was blue. So Palmasola Bay wasn't impaired. The upper part of the bay had bad water quality one year, but it has to be more than one in three years to be declared impaired. But the lower part of the bay from Ringling Causeway all the way down to Venice Inlet uh, exceeded the criteria that we developed ourselves 10 years ago. So we had water quality problems that were severe enough to put us under regulatory oversight, but no longer. So the question is, why did they determine that you've actually no longer become impaired? Is this some bureaucratic decision? And the answer is no, it's because our water quality has been getting better. So this is the axis that shows how much algae is in the water in four different bay segments 
over time and its annual averages. And what you'll see is this downward trend. Our water quality has been getting better for three to four years now. And the last three years shown here, we have different targets for each one of those base segments, but each one of those four base segments have met their individual targets for three years in a row. And some people might say, well, you're just, you're just taking advantage of a drought. You know, so it's been not raining, that's why it's getting better. The drought's in 2023. This data set ends in 2022 when we had Hurricane Ian. So this isn't, the 2023 water quality data is even better than what we've got here. So what we've got here is this is what happens when you pay attention to your pollutant loads it actually can make a difference across a system that's 50 square miles, 70 billion gallons. So we don't believe it's driven by rainfall because in all of Southwest Florida, there are only 10 water bodies that are delisted. In other words, improving enough to become off the impaired waters list. We have half of them here in Sarasota Bay. So we have half of all the ones in all of Southwest Florida. So we're a hot spot for water quality improvements. So this is the most complicated graph I got here, but I know you guys can get it because this is actually something that, uh, um, it explains everything that's happening here. So on the bottom axis, the x-axis is years. So the blue represents that reference period, the yellow represents that degraded time period, and the purple represents things getting better, what we call the improving trends. So there's a couple of lines that go up and down. And what they are is we're trying to figure out a way to display a lot of data on the same graph. So we have nitrogen concentrations of two different forms. We have red, red tide forming organism, and then we have a measure of all the algae in a bay. The big point here is that notice how all those uh, peak in that yellow time period, right? And then they go down. So they're fairly low and then they go up and then they go down. And the, the reason why that we can express it that way is on the y-axis on the left-hand side, it's standard deviation. So if you remember stats, one standard deviation is fairly rare. It should only happen once out of every six years. Two is even rarer. And instead what we have is multiple things get worse in that yellow period and then they get better. There is one line that ticks up again in that purple, that is Karenia brevis, the organism that causes red tide, and that's because we think of the 2023 red tide associated with 2022's Hurricane Ian that came through. Um, but the reason why all those things got worse is those lines that go up and down. So the vertical lines represent the volume of wastewater spills, <coughs> and the axis for them is on the right-hand side. We're using scientific notation here. 2E8, you see that number on the top there? That's 200 million gallons. 1E8 is 100 million gallons. We had five wastewater overflows over 100 million gallons in the lower part of the bay in seven years. We had three more than 200 million gallons. All in all, we had 1.2 billion gallons of wastewater. So I know that there are issues with every wastewater treatment plant. This was basically 1.2 billion gallons of wastewater overflows, and it set us back in that lower part of the bay set us back about 20 years in terms of our progress. So 1.2 billion gallons is a big amount, but it's a small percentage. So uh, 1.2 billion gallons is less than 5% of the wastewater treated by the wastewater treatment plants in the southern part. So they did a great job for 95% of the volume, but that last 5% was enough to give us all the problems that we saw in that lower part of the bay. So. The improvements that we see, the reason why everything is getting better, we think is because of these types of activities. So uh, the $25 million already spent by uh, Mansi County, uh, those two stormwater treatment projects, one million and three million, they've already treated 6,000 acres of urbanized watershed, those are done. Sarasota County is by far having to do more because they've got the biggest problems. But Sarasota County is well underway with a $250 million project, which is the largest single capital improvement project history in Sarasota County's history. So um, we expect widespread benefits that are not just chemists to be able to notice or statisticians. So the picture on the left is our colleague from the Water Management District snorkeling over uh, an area where we're mapping seagrasses. And he's snorkeling over that bay area, but you see all the dark signature around that? That's all seagrass. No one planted it. There's no gimmick involved. If the, you get your pollutant loads under control, your water quality improve, and the seagrass came back on its own. And the reason why that matters is, uh, one of the reasons why is the things that are being held by the people on the right-hand side. Anyone know what those are? Fish. What type of fish? Can't see. <laughs> Juvenile gag grouper. Oh. So if you like to eat grouper, you catch them out in the Gulf of Mexico, but in their younger ages, they're in places like Sarasota Bay. So if Sarasota Bay and Tampa Bay fall apart as estuaries, it's gonna adversely affect 
offshore fisheries of grouper, but that's not the case. Our system's getting healthier. Those are the three juvenile gag grouper found in the grass beds that we're now increasing. So uh, I'd be remiss to not talk about the challenges in the future, which is uh, this is uh, one of the things that we're going to have to deal with more and more. This is blue sky flooding. This is Longboat Key Village. Uh, people there tell me that their streets flood twice a month uh, because the sea level has come up. And over the last 20 years, our water level has come up about six inches. That's three inches per decade. Over the last 5,000 years, which is roughly how long we've had civilization, it's been about an inch a decade. So we're transitioning towards a higher rate of sea level rise than we've had over the last 5,000 years. Uh, it's not several feet, but it's several inches. It's not nothing. And so this is the reason why we basically want to make people realize that you need to <coughs> anticipate sea level rise. Over the next 30 years, we expect about another nine inches. Our tidal range is 18 inches. And what that means is in the year 2050, your average sea level will be what today's high tide is, and the average high tide will be nine inches stacked on top of that. So the problems that you guys are addressing, I believe right now, this is Rearview Boulevard, Manti Avenue. The picture on the top shows where the water's coming in. This is blue sky flooding, it's not rainfall. This is water from Manti River. And the picture on the bottom uh, is that's not a canal, that was actually the water uh, in the streets. Uh, the reason why that's happening is because it's just getting warmer. This is a temperature plot for Sarasota County and it compares every month across 120 years against the average of the last century. So all the months of January from 1900 to year 2000. And if you're warmer than the average over that last century, you're yellows and browns. So what we see is it is just getting warmer. We're not getting the freezes that we used to get. Uh, we used to average two to three freezing temperatures per year on average for 100 years. We just don't have that anymore. And we used to start off August days in the 60s, not every day, but we haven't had a single hour of a single day in the last 20 years where it's been cooler than 70 degrees in August. So it's just getting warmer. Thermal expansion of the water, just the way a hot air balloon rises up in the air, is what's going on right now. There's reason to be concerned about that because warm water and warm, moist air are fuel for tropical storms. And we have a data set that goes back to before the Civil War, and that red line represents a five-point moving average. For the North Atlantic, it looks like we're getting more tropical storms, but the more interesting thing is the graphic on the right-hand side. Major hurricanes are category three, four, and five. We used to have a lot of years where we had hurricanes. We've always had major hurricanes, but what we see in the first part of that is there were lots of years where we had a hurricane, but it wouldn't be a three, four, or five. And now it's fairly rare that if we have a hurricane, it's not a major hurricane. So the thing that seems to be happening is we're not necessarily getting a lot more hurricanes, but the hurricanes we're getting are more powerful. Hurricane Michael in 2018 went from a tropical storm to category five in three days, which scared a lot of people. Hurricane Otis, the one that hit Acapulco last year, went from a tropical storm to category five hurricane in less than a day. And it hit a batch of water in the Eastern Pacific, uh, 88 degrees. We're a lot warmer than 88 degrees. So it is, you know, what we're seeing is warm air, warm, moist water, excuse me, warm, moist air, warm water is adding more fuel. Uh, but in this case, the engine of a tropical storm doesn't produce anything you want to have, it just produces winds and waves. So more fuel, stronger engine. And uh, the reason why I work uh, uh, concerned about this is, well, we live here, number one, but the other part is what it does to our water quality. So this is the lower part of the bay uh, before and after Ian came through. Um, this water looked like root beer. It didn't smell like root beer. It smelled like dead fish and compost, because that's what it was, basically. We had so many um, you know, dog poop and leaf litter and uh, porta potties tipped over that tipped into the bay that we had uh, fish kills that lasted for two weeks, but it didn't last <coughs> two months. So our water quality had recovered within about a month, but the way it recovered was it flushed out into the Gulf of Mexico, which is the reason why we had such a bad red tide in 2023. So cleaner bay is a more resilient bay. And if you want more information, uh, follow us, sarasotabay.org or on social media or point your phone at that QR code and you'll go to an ArcGIS version of our uh, management plan. And with that, I am finished. Thank you for your time. Yep. Questions? Um, I, I thought... Uh, <sighs> a representative on the Sarasota Bay. Can yes. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you. I, I, it's a pleasure to serve on this board and I think they're doing a fabulous job as evidenced here. But I think that um, it would help if you would let them know we recently were reviewed by EPA. And I think it'd be good to know that it's not just 
us that thinks he's great. <laughs> yeah, we had, I think last year, we had a program evaluation. It happens, I don't know, every five years or so, they come down. And so we uh, uh, we had a great review. It, it went very well. They, uh, we had some issues in the past that we had to address. I think we're, we have great staff. Megan Berry's in the room right there. She does a fantastic job of uh, increasing our profile in the community. Um, but it went really well, and uh, we had Jane was out there, and uh, we had a ribbon cutting event at the Fish Preserve. So we had a super time. We've sailed through it, and they've asked me to actually be on a review committee for the New York New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program uh, because ours went so well. So thanks to you, and thanks to the policy board who actually you know allows us to do the work that we think matters. Vice Mayor Barnaby. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate oh, you coming you. in and and uh, giving us factual data that, that can help us in our decision making. Uh, I seem to remember when I was back on the estuary board in 2010 or 2012, somewhere around there, uh, we actually did an economic study to come up with exactly how much is the value yeah. to the bay. Ha and, and again, I haven't been involved with the estuary program since then. Have, have you done an update to that, or will you be looking at doing an update to that? Yeah, um, so that study was done in 2017, and we could update it, but I'm kind of like, I'm not really into the study mode. So <laughs> it's a lot of money, mm -hmm. and it's more money than we're spending. So to me, it was like a $3 billion property value uplift, 20,000 jobs. They're probably both higher now. And we could do it again, but I'd rather actually just focus our effort on projects because I've never had anyone say three billion isn't enough or 20,000 aren't enough jobs. So I'm gonna go with like, it was already a big enough of a economic impact for people to be willing to spend what they're spending. And, and I understand that, I appreciate that. We just know that sometimes when you have uh, the ships coming in and out of yeah. Tampa Bay and that sort of thing, the acts, I mean, if, Look at what happened in Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, just I just want to make sure that we have factual data on the economic value, in case we have something of sure. significant disaster happen. Understood. Absolutely. <laughs> Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tomasco, for the informative and factual and scientific presentation. I'm always just uh, uh, amazed at, at, at how good a job you guys do, and, and I'm glad we're able to. Uh, Councilwoman Coker is intricately involved in, in, in your uh, group. But I'm on the operational management side of things, being a city manager, basically. Right. And so when we talk about um, certain wastewater components in particular, that's something that's near and dear to my heart because our teams have to address that. Right. And we deal with it in two components. One is a collection component. Rob, can you pull the microphone sorry, a little closer? Yep. One is a collection component, and the second is a wastewater treatment component. Right. right. And, and really, when we talk about the city of Bradenton, we, we treat somewhere in the order of six to about eight million gallons per day of wastewater. And you, you, you made a sentence about they captured 95% of it and did a pretty good job. And, yeah. and, and that is a good job, but we want to capture 100% of it, right? I mean, that's what the overall objective is. But in, in Sarasota, when, when they get into environmental problems, my understanding was over a short, shorter period of time, about three years, there was over a billion uh, gallons of water that went into the bay. And, and, and It was oh, about seven years in general where we had the problems, but yeah, three years were the maximum. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest issues we had, the, the several hundred million uh, overflows were in about a three year period, uh, which coincided with our worst water quality. Right, right. And, and, and we're, you know, we're looking at major investments in wastewater treatment as well as collection to minimize uh, any sort of delirious and negative impact on the environment from our, from our wastewater system. Um, but when I look at it overall, and, and we had a spill fairly recently that was a million gallons, and of course we go into the, the Manatee River, not yeah. the Sarasota estuary or, or any of the bays associated with it, but when I look at the volume of the Manatee River, and I, I say, look, I wish our, our goal is zero, but a million gallons is a drop in literally, um, I don't know, a large swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, comparatively and relatively. Is that scientifically a fair well there's assessment? there's the, the there's the concept of uh, mixing zones assimilative capacity so you're allowed to have 
uh, discharges of AWT effluent 100% right. under state law, the Grizzle Fig Act. Um, but you guys don't have that. You have day-to-day -day very little. I don't think that you have a direct surface discharge that you use every day um, because you send it to places that they need water, which is smart. Um, there is a bigger impact where the outfall occurs. And so what we had is we had so much of a wastewater uh, inflow. A billion gallons is a thousand times bigger than a million gallons. And so what you had is uh, a thousand times what you just had uh, we had a thousand times worse in the lower part of the bay, and, and I think that's really the, the key, that, you know, spills will happen. I mean, a one million gallon uh, overflow isn't something anyone should be happy about, and I know you guys aren't happy about it, but we had five that were over 100 million. We had three that were over 200 million. Those overwhelmed that system. That's, that's a massive discharge. Right. And, and I just... I think you follow the city enough, and, and we appreciate your, your interest in the city to know that we're making significant investments into our wastewater treatment system. I think we have about $50 million in SRF loans that deal with both collection and wastewater treatment. Collection gets underappreciated. Uh, Everyone loves to go to ribbon cuttings for the plant. Right. But the, what really happened, the problems that we had in Sarasota County is uh, in excessive inflow associated I I. with the cracked pipes and leaking pipes, and those are like decades old. The plant may be brand new. The pipes are decades old, and that's the big part of what you guys are investing We have in. 62 miles of clay yeah. pipe, and, and we've replaced 35, <coughs> we lined it, and we'll continue to line it. What people don't understand is that during the wet season, what ends up happening is all that rain saturates the ground, gets into the wastewater plant uh, system, and so we have to treat so much of it, it overcapacitates yeah. the plant. Absolutely. Yeah. We appreciate working with the scientists like yourself and, and have a great deal of respect for your opinions, and it's very strategically helpful for us. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Councilwoman Moore? Um, when you say in the slide um, about future complications, and you talk a little bit about population growth and a need, a hold the line strategy. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I apologize. That's actually one of the main things I wanted to talk about. So, <laughs> um, because our water quality got better, we no longer have an impairment. So there's no need for what the next step is typically uh, a total maximum daily load, which is a state or a federal government oversight to basically say you need to reduce your nutrient loads to get your water quality under control we don't need that anymore because our water quality is now under control so what we were going down the pathway was to do a, what's called a reasonable assurance plan which is a local version of a total maximum daily load when the water quality improves so much uh, we brought this to our policy board's attention including uh, jane and we said well there's three options. One of them is do nothing more because regulatory-wise, you don't have to do anything more. Go forward with a reasonable assurance plan, which is a regulatory document, but there's no real need to do that. Or to do a third option, which is what we call a water quality protection plan. And that's what they decided to move forward with. So a water quality protection plan would be, we would anticipate what would happen to pollutant loads over the next 30 years as our population grows. So more impervious area, more rooftops, more roadways, more driveways, more roads, more stormwater runoff, more sewage. And we need to figure out what kind of a load increase would happen with the population growth over 30 years and come up with projects to offset that so that we can hold the line on pollutant loads so we don't let this water quality uh, restoration success story slip away from us. So it wouldn't be a regulatory program because there's no one out of compliance but it would be instead a publicly facing document that allows the general public, anyone, to go there and say, all right, so they said they were gonna reduce 17 tons per year, are they doing that? And, and if so, who needs to do what more to do that? So we work with the city of Bradenton and all our local stakeholders to come up with a list of projects to help us hold the line on pollutant loads for the next 30 years. So Dr. Tomasco, you and I had a conversation I don't know, maybe a year ago or so after a meeting with water keepers that, uh, over in Palmetto at the Yacht Club yeah. that we talked about maybe some of your neighbors and some of your, your that development is, is causing the problem. And you had mentioned to me that mm -hmm. development sometimes can help the situation because they're putting in the new infrastructure mm -hmm. that is keeping the eye and eye out. And, there's, and you had mentioned about an individual that was probably the loudest, but he had a septic tank right on the bay yeah. somewhere. And those issues, sometimes people think, oh, well, they're doing development, 
and the old, if it's just one house, but if every house on that street has a septic tank, that is, could actually be more detrimental to the bay than a new development that is putting in the proper um, infrastructure that will get it to the right place to be treated properly and then dealt with. Is that, did I, did I remember that correctly? Yeah, uh, the way I look at it is uh, there's nothing natural about most of Florida and certainly not our watershed. Uh, we have, like, there's only 2% of our watershed is in a natural estate, and that's Oscar Shearer. 98% of what you see looking down you know, from a plane is rooftops, driveways, sidewalks, roads, and that sort of stuff. So we're basically built out. So um, the question we have then is, um, can we make better water quality? And the proof is we can. And there's lots of examples out there. Uh, New York, New Jersey Harbor. Hudson River is cleaner now than it's been at any time since before the Civil War. We've had three US presidents who've died from bacteria related to sewage contamination. We haven't had one recently who's died because of bacteria related to sewage contamination. So the Hudson River is cleaner. The Thames River in uh, London is cleaner than it's been in centuries. Um, Tampa Bay is cleaner. Sarasota Bay, despite that setback, is still cleaner than it was in the 80s. So we know that we can have cleaner water with more development. It depends on how you develop. And one of the things that we see is new development, for example, has stormwater treatment ponds. Old development doesn't. So uh, someone who lives in a neighborhood that was built in the 50s who complains about like Lakewood Ranch, for example, Lakewood Ranch has like, uh, they're using your effluent, for example, and Sarasota cities to water their lawns. So they're not using drinking water to water their lawns. They're using reclaimed water, which actually means you don't have to have a surface discharge. Plus they have stormwater treatment ponds. So there are issues with new development and traffic <laughs> but not necessarily new development causes water quality degradation. There's plenty <coughs> of examples that show you can have more people and better water quality. And that's just the way it is. And it's not a political statement, that's just what the data show. I think one of the most important things to do is we look through as a body up here of development. We know that we have 14.4 square miles, that we are not a north port that has hundreds of miles of development available. Northport, you know, virtually right now is the same size as the city of Sarasota, the city of Bradenton, but both of us are landlocked with our boundaries where Northport will be a county in itself in 2050 when they have 200,000 residents, and we're probably still gonna be somewhere around 60, just because even if we grow a little bit with some urban core development, but it's important, I think, to this council as well as the community that, that we continue to look at ways to develop our urban core while allowing the developments to work in the development as well as the city to fix some of that old aging infrastructure that could actually benefit the water quality. And just because you're adding something doesn't mean you're tearing down that water, water quality, you actually could help build it up because of the, the I&I and, &I and all the things that are, that are out there now. So that's something I think important to remember. Yeah, we'll need to like, I mean, the number one thing we have to focus on is our wastewater. And you know, so you need to have a, a healthy enough economy to pay for your wastewater upgrades. I mean, there's lots of places in West Virginia that have the same problem and don't have enough money to fix it. Uh, there is one thing that, however, and I forgot to mention it, uh, that is uh, one of the biggest concerns we have moving forward also is uh, seawalls, concrete seawalls being replaced with plastic seawalls. It's a big deal. Um, we have about 100 miles of uh, canals that are seawalls that are concrete that are being replaced with like polyvinyl chloride or fiberglass. They just don't grow oysters. And what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to work with, you know, you guys are involved with the, the Oyster River Project. The goal is to have 100 acres of uh, oysters out there. We also want to make sure that we do projects to, uh, um, with vertical oyster gardens, with mangrove panels, because if we don't, we're going to lose a significant amount of our oyster reef habitat, which is good habitat, filters water quality along our seawall. So uh, we're working with Longboat Key to come up with a way to uh, allow oysters to grow on these plastic seawalls by adding a concrete panel that goes on the outside. Otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of the water quality benefits over time as those concrete seawalls get replaced with plastic ones. Well, great. I think that's a, obviously a great update. And I think it's something that it shows that, that, you know, propaganda gets out there. And again, we don't want any type of spills. We don't want anything. But 
we just got to work within the facts and make sure that the, the public understands that we are doing something big in the whole Sarasota Bay, whether it's Sarasota County, the city of Sarasota, Manatee County, the city of Bradenton, and others that are in those municipalities and areas. So we appreciate you being here and taking your time. And, and you came over on the right day on spring break. Yeah, Didn't really. have to, to <laughs> Didn't get the traffic. Minutes. Yep. So, all right. Well, appreciate Thank it. you. Appreciate Thank it. You. All right, moving forward, it's in the citizen comment time. A citizen comments will be accepted during the citizen comment portion of the meeting on any non-agenda item, agenda item, future agenda item, or topic of relevance to the city. Comments will be accepted on the public hearings at the appropriate time. And I just have one card for Tracy Washington. If Tracy can come forward, please state your name and your city of residence for the record. And you'll have three minutes. Good morning, Council. Oh, okay. I'm Tracy Washington, um, city of residence is Palmetto, Florida. I am the president and founder of the Minnesota Reentry Project, and I'm also your second vice president of Manatee NAACP. I'm here today standing um, as a mother, though, today. My title today is a mother. I'm the mother of Briante Johnson Davis that lost his life while in custody of the Palmetto Police Department. Um, I stand before you today because there um, were accusations that there was an investigation launched by the Bradenton Police Department because there was an officer that was involved with the incident. Um, so I stand here today because I can't get any answers through email or public record requests because they're telling me that it's under investigation at this present time. So my questions today for the city council is, when did this investigation begin? Um, when and were the city council members made aware of the incident? I want to know the training of the officers, mental training, mental health training and substance abuse where is the officer now officer julian jackson i need to know if he's on administrative leave if he's still on the streets i need to know where the officer is and what is the protocol for the police department to notify the family because i was never notified about an investigation that was open when fdle and the prosecutor closed and cleared these officers so i'm my question is when and, oh Lord, I'm so frustrated. Give me a minute. My question here today is, why do we have another investigation open? And when was I going to be notified about this? Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have no other citizen comments, so I'm going to ask Chief Bevan to come forward. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to review this. Uh, I've actually stood before you in the past and, and kind of reviewed how we do things, and, and it's by law, and it's by policy, and it's what we've always done here. And so um, a few things happen when situations occur, particularly something such as this, where we had an officer involved in the ultimate death of somebody in custody. Um, a criminal investigation has to occur first. In this particular instance, this was a criminal investigation that was conducted by FDLE, I think in conjunction with Palmetto Police Department. Um, during a criminal investigation, we can't touch that. We're, we're not the entity that is doing the investigation. <coughs> Although we may have an involved person, we need to wait for the findings to be forwarded to um, the prosecutor's office and for the prosecutors to make a decision state attorney's office whether there's going to be any criminal charges brought forward at the conclusion of that the Bradenton police department then looks at situations such as this to see if any administrative violations may or may not have occurred when i say administrative violations it could be anything from um somebody being out of their area um, uh, you know, was, was proper force used from our perspective in compliance with what our uh, general orders stipulate and mandate. Um, 
state law requires that all these investigations, as I've said in the past, um, are confidential. That's not our rule, that is a state law. These are confidential investigations. In fact, we have received a number of public records requests and every single one of these records requests have been responded to with just that language, that these are confidential. When the investigation concludes, and I, I will tell you, I don't think that this is gonna be a protracted investigation. Most everything has been handed to us. Um, we're looking over it. It's gonna come before me to look at all the facts and circumstances, and then we'll render a decision on whether any administrative violations occurred involving our officer only, just the Brainton Police Department. I can't speak for how Palmetto handles situations like this or any other agency. We've always handled um, situations like this for all the years I've been here and probably then some. Um, we're not trying to step back from any kind of situation. We're actually stepping forward and making sure that just because FDLE and the state attorney's office said there's no problem here, we're gonna make that decision as well in accordance with our policies and procedures. Everybody who's made records requests, we can show that we've responded, um, and that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to speak with her further outside and answer any questions that I have in front of you today. Okay, thank you. Mayor, if I could just point out one important legal point is that when Chief speaks about it being confidential, that isn't something that they deem confidential, it's a matter of state law. It would be illegal to provide those records when they're deemed by state law as confidential. It would be a crime by the police department to do that because the state has basically determined that investigations should be independent and they shouldn't be influenced by external forces until they're concluded. Thank you. All right, have no other public comment, Madam Clerk? The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda and staff is requesting approval of items A through F. All right, Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve consent agenda. All right. Second. All right, Councilman Kramer and a second by Councilwoman Coachman. Is there any other comment? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 2. Yes. 3. Yes. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. And 1. Yes. Carries unanimously. Madam Clerk. Item 8A is the first reading for Ordinance 4025. An ordinance of the City of Bradenton, Florida, providing for an amendment to the City of Bradenton Land Use Atlas, changing zoning from T4R, General Urban Restricted, to T4O, General Urban Open, for properties located at 910 Riverside Drive East, 111 10th Street East, 1008 Riverside Drive East, 1010 Riverside Drive East, and 1020 Riverside Drive East. The parcel ID numbers are 3219 3010 and 3210500309, providing for applicability, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. And the second reading and public hearing is scheduled for April 10th. April 10th, 410, at our 8.30 a.m. meeting. Correct. All right, moving forward. Item 8B is the first reading for Ordinance 4026, an ordinance of the City of Bradenton, Florida, providing for an amendment to the City of Bradenton Land Use Atlas, changing zoning from T4O General Urban Open to T5 Urban Center for properties located at 214 9th Street East, 208 9th Street East, 112 9th Street East, 110 9th Street East, 108 9th Street East, 406 9th Street East, 304 9th Street East, and 402 9th Street East. Parcel ID numbers are 3134 Zero 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 two three one three five one zero 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 three seven excuse me three one three seven nine zero 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 one 
313-6200-007 and 313-500-009. Removing properties located at 214 9th Street East, 208 9th Street East, 112 9th Street East, 110 9th Street East, 108 9th Street East, 406 9th Street East, 304 9th Street East, 301 9th Street East, 201 9th Street East, 825 3rd Avenue East, 108 8th Street East, 106 8th Street East, 807 3rd Avenue East, and 402 9th Street <coughs> East. And the parcel ID numbers are 313 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-436-0008, 313-
and then also Willis Smith, the team here with Robbie and Brett. Um, we just worked really hard at an exceptional design, and uh, these guys did a great job uh, focusing on uh, the budgetary needs of the project, which they're going to uh, talk about that now. Um, but uh, uh, I think we this is a project that uh, we're proud of, and I hope the city's going to be proud of. It's definitely working with these guys has been great. Thank you. Now, Robbie, talk briefly about the GMP efforts. Good morning, everybody. So with the construction budget set at $7.75 million, and our early estimates coming in between 8 and $8.4 million, John touched on it, but we went to work. Uh, and there was a significant effort that went into cost reduction strategies without sacrificing the program for the firemen or the design intent for what will be that gateway into the city. And we're able to bring that GMP in at $7.9 million. Uh, and that was a significant effort from our market. Uh, so we invited over 280 subcontractors and suppliers to bid this project. We received well over 100 actual proposals that went into that uh, final GMP that we're presenting to you today. And then upon approval, we would anticipate mobilizing and put a shovel in the ground starting June of this year. So a summer start, and then it would be a summer finish 2025. Any questions? Here, if I could just summarize a couple of points. Sure. Um, when we initially uh, looked at this from a pre-construction services perspective, council may remember that uh, we had done some preliminary uh, estimates through both uh, Willis Smith and Folly, and, and our cost estimates were really between seven and, and nine million. Um, and uh, again, it, it's 7.9. Uh, so we're in the middle, uh, John and, and Brett, really did an exceptional job, along with John Toddy, Lance Williams, and some other folks here at the city, and, the, and the, of course the fire department, the, the chiefs and, and their staff, in, in, in really sharpening their pencil. And, and, and I don't think they compromised on the programmatic perspectives, but what they didn't do was uh, they didn't allow certain expensive uh, uh, types of components to creep up the price of the project. And, and ultimately, when you look at the rendering itself, it's a great looking fire station, in my opinion. Um, it, the city will be proud. It's on the entryway of the east side into the city, obviously, on State Road 64. The service area itself is very challenging. The chief and I had had a lot of conversations with him, uh, chief and his staff regarding really what that station services and some of the fire department operations that the chief could get into much better than I could, uh, but it's an important important asset for the city. And I'd also point out that it's the second of, of, of two fire stations that we've built over the course of the last uh, three or four years. Um, uh, we, we think it's a, a pretty good value in today's construction world. It is more expensive. When we hear that we were able to build station three, uh, uh, three for uh, three million dollars, it's important to understand that we actually had Folly go out to the market and say, this was probably a year and a half ago, how much would it cost a year and a half ago to build station three? And it was about 150% of what we were able to build it at because it priced out in 2020 thereabouts. And so even station three would have cost a great deal more than three million if that was built in today's, in, 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 in when I say today's market, the market of a year and a half ago because the construction costs have gone up even over the last year and a half. That's just what we're facing um, with, with, with major commercial specialized construction such as this. Uh, if you take the size of it and cost it out um, on a square foot based it, basis, it's, it's still pretty reasonable. This station is one and a half times the size of station three too at roughly 14,000 plus square feet, almost 15,000. So that's the project. It will ultimately come back to council for final approval of the, of the GMP in contract form, but we thought it was important to bring to you what we have today. And, and my hat goes off to the selection of these professionals from the architecture and engineering, the pre-construction, the, the CMAR, the department itself, the, our city, John Toddy's done a good job. And so we're, we're pretty proud to bring this to you and we'll be, uh, greatly uh, pleased when we start construction in June. Um, we will have a construction wrap a fence with a wrapping uh, advising the public of the construction of this new public safety facility. Um, the placards on it will display the fire department, the city of Bradenton, our partners to the private development of the project, and I think the citizens will know that their tax dollars going to worthwhile public safety projects. Any questions? 
Yes, ma'am, Ms. Moore. Um, it's not really a question. It's just a point of clarification because I, I think it's, imp I don't want to have anybody misconstrue that this is the construction budget, so it does not include contingencies in the fee. It, it does. That guaranteed maximum price will include 3% contingency and the fee. It does. Yes, it's all inclusive. And this is a different contract form than what you did on the previous station. Right. Guaranteed maximum price is the most that you're going to pay for this station. Mm -hmm. Anything that is savings is 100% return back to the city of Bradenton. And that's what a GMP is. The, that's why we're going with this. And I think that when we went with the previous fire station, you know, it was a timing thing, and I think then COVID hit, and so there was a lot of other issues and a lot of other problems that we had. And I think that, you know, looking back, we probably should have went with a GMP on that. That's just my opinion, and I think that, you know, we learned from that at that moment. So, Vice Mayor Barnaby. Thank you. Chief Gear. I just wanted to uh, thank you for all the work that you all all of you have put into this. I think we all know that station number two right now is not the type of fire station that we want to have in the city. It's outlived its usefulness. It's very tiny. It's in a very interesting uh, location, difficult to get out onto the main streets from it. Um, so I'm very happy to see this. I just want to double check because of all of the information that has come out dealing with firefighters and incidences of cancer, just as we did at Station 3 where we set up basically, for lack of a better way to describe it, dirty to clean areas. We are doing that in this station, correct? A hundred percent. So we, we sent all that information over to uh, Folly Bryant, um, really back with Station 3. We sent updates to them as well. So all those areas are separated. Uh, to keep clean areas and then also with ventilation, AC systems, um, you know, uh, just redundancy in our, in our washing areas, things of that nature. So all those requirements, are, requirements have been met. And, um, you know, kind of Station 3 was our original kind of kickoff for that. And we maintained that same, you know, basic <laughs> design with the uh, cancer reduction um, in mind as we move forward. So thank you very much for asking that. And I think another important factor is that we learned some things from Station 3 that we probably didn't repeat on Station 2, doing them so close together. And, Chief, I look back to that rainy morning many years ago that we drove around looking for a piece of property. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, I mean, we could have, we could have looked for years, mm -hmm. but, you know, this property was available at the right price and I think it was great of this council um, to take that leap at the right time and now the the fruit some within a don't want to wish any of our lives away but within a year and a half will show that we're able to get quicker to some of the areas in that segment and you know as we know whether it's a fire whether it's the um, safety of health issues mm -hmm. that moments count and that i think will show and so that is well worth getting you know that new station in the process and i think at station two don't you have to walk through one thing to get to another and well you know, well we do yeah. and uh, you look at all the current building codes and yeah. fire codes i don't think it meets any of those That's i mean good. you're talking to you know 40 50 year old right. building and, and it's time and it, it's just time yeah. and uh you know, we, we appreciate that old station, but it's definitely time to move on. And uh, like you said, this will serve the public a lot better with times on the east side, and, you know, and getting down in that 27th Street East Corridor where we have new neighborhoods going in. And uh, so, you know, we, we really appreciate you all moving forward on this and appreciate the support. Well, and thank you and, and all of your staff and, and firefighters putting in the, the newest technology things that we need to really work through and i know with our staff in the administration as well as the the, the builder and the architect yes sir continue to work it because again nobody wants to spend more money than we have to but we've got to spend what we need so thank you well thank you too here with that i would request a, a motion to approve the the gmp as proposed i just also point out that uh i'd said the 
the per square foot cost was was fairly uh, the pretty reasonable in today's market. It's actually five hundred thirty three dollars a square foot, and uh, in today's commercial specialized construction market, that's pretty good for fifteen thousand square feet. Chair will entertain a motion to approve the GMP. Mr. B Mr. Mayor, motion to approve the guaranteed maximum maximum. Hey, Ms. Oh. Barnaby, I'd seen Mrs. Oh, I'm Moore sorry. More first. So. <laughs> okay. So, I so move. <laughs> okay. Second. All right, perfect, thank you. We have a motion and a second to guarantee the GMP on this project. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll start the vote in Ward 3. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Mayor, for the day. Yes. Good luck. Mr. Perry. Next item B, 9B, is the City Administration's request for Public Works and Utilities Director uh, recommendation uh, for Colonel Urban Lee. And I think we have a letter. Do we have a letter for that? It's attached to it the agenda. It is attached to the package mm -hmm. and the agenda, right. Um, as, as Council knows, um, uh, we've had Mr. Rudicell opine a little bit on, on confirmation requirements for directors. And as I remember, uh, it, it, it's a situation where for hiring of a director, the charter is, is silent and it doesn't require co uh, formal confirmation uh, for, for removal of a director. It's a little bit different. But as a practical matter, we always submit it to council because we want the endorsement of council and then we want council to know uh, of such important positions and get the, the uh, confirmation um, approved. Uh, as you know, um, Colonel Lee has a very, very extensive record in public works. Um, he has phenomenal education backgrounds. He currently runs the U.S. Space Command in Colorado Springs as a retired um, uh, former military colonel, but in a civilian G-15 position, which is the highest general service position, I believe, in the federal scale. His, uh, his academic background is, is tremendous with multiple engineering degrees in both civil and engineering, as well as certifications by state agencies, including the Professional Engineering Association of Florida. Um, he had previously been in charge of facilities for MacDill Air Force Base and the Central Command, which were all near and dear to our heart and the role that that plays in the national defense, as well as the, had been the director of public works in Tampa. Uh, the background investigation, I believe I had forwarded to you, which was rather extensive. It called all types of references, prior employment, um, as well as uh, uh, specific 15 uh, individual interviews that were conducted with people that the colonel had worked with. I think the best thing I can say about the colonel is he wants to be here. Aside from, from those incredibly impressive uh, background credentials, I think he really wants to be here. It's a return to Southwest Florida. His family, his wife is, is, is up in the Tampa area. He plans to relocate closer uh, into Manatee County. And um, he's looking at it as a great opportunity for this point in his career to make valuable, constructive contributions to an entity that is on the, on the rise, such as Bradenton. We spent a day with him. We took him to the department, introduced him to staff, took him to the Spirit of Manatee Awards, where many of you got to speak with him and meet him in an informal, somewhat informal uh, environment, as well as individual one-on-one -on -one meetings. And we appreciate you taking the time on that day, which was kind of a busy day to do that. Uh, I, I'm really excited about what the Colonel can bring in terms of leadership. We've also, uh, oddly after the fact of the formalities of the, invest the background investigation and experience, have been able to speak with multiple people who just have worked in the public works arena here in, in, in the Tampa Bay area. And I think we had three or four people say, I work with him and he was great. He's awesome and everything. So, you know, I, I just think uh, that we really got a gem. Um, I hope it works out and that I'm not uh, overselling things to, to a certain extent. <laughs> but to bring in that kind of background to the city of Bradenton, I'm, I'm proud we're able to bring that type of leadership background and experience. He served the country, he served the state, he served the, city, you know, the, the surrounding area. And uh, I think with the challenges we have in the public work, work sector, remember 266 employees out of 600, it's 48% of the city. 
and uh, we touched 11 different divisions. We heard Dr. Tomasco talk about some of the challenges on utility infrastructure, environmental impacts. We got to get busy. We got a long way to go and a short time to get there. And, and this is a fellow that I really well, hope you could support. Your, it's your recommendation to hire the Colonel? I believe it's my recommendation. I believe it's also the recommendation of Mr. Williams and well as the entirety of uh, HR. The, the, the HR and, 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 and the public works staff. They're excited. Mr. Mayor. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Any questions? No, sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Coach. Um, I'd like to move to approve the recommendation of Colonel Irvin Lee as the city's public works and utilities director. Second. All right. We have a motion by Councilwoman Coachman, a second by Vice Mayor Barnaby. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 4. Yes. 5. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Carries five to zero. So, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mayor. Good phone call later today. Absolutely. Make it happen. All right. Do it now. All right. And the last matter, item C, is a community redevelopment agency temporary public art display in City Hall. And, and we're going to show you a, a kind of a rendering of <clears throat> the display itself and do you have an uh, a depiction of the area that this is going yes. to be displayed in you want that first? yeah let's start with that if All we right. could yep mayor this is uh, obviously going to be displayed in, in the city hall building the public art board of course is a component of the cra um and and uh miss farmer does a great job over there this uh, proposal was bought to miss farmer from a young lady that i'll let her describe a little bit of the background of the of the public art itself, um, the process that it went through through the public art board, the individual um, and the collaborative the individual took with a lot of other artists from the area. Uh, what we're talking about is displaying it on this wall that is depicted, I believe, on the right side of my visual where the sailboats and the, and the birds are depicted. Um, it will be uh, dimensionally 9 feet by 12 feet, I believe. It's sized as four um, horizontal panels that are each three feet <coughs> wide totaling 12 wide and three verticals of, of three feet so it's by nine feet tall it'll take up a good part of that wall um, and with that i'll turn it over to miss farmer okay. welcome hi there good morning we actually have the artist here with us today too i've invited her up and yay her wonderful to yes i will go ahead and so hi guys, good morning. Uh, my name is Annie Dong. I'm also a fourth year thesis -ing student at New College of Florida with my major in art and psychology. Um, and that's kind of what's inspired this overall project. I want to let you guys know that this mural was designed by the teens, all designed by them. I just assisted with building the panels and giving them a theme of who are we. Um, and then I let them take on whatever they decide to design. Um, so I only assisted and they designed the um, mural. And I'm very inspired by them being really young, talented, young artists. And my goal was to also invite other teens at the Boys and Girls Club who are not really interested in arts to also join the project to see what they might like connect with other teens. And this is the outcome of it. Um, the mural shows positive affirmations by individual teens, such as I am loved, I am brave, I am courageous. And this is like a reminder to other teens that they are in, they are also connected. So having this mural displayed in the city hall can mean a lot to um, the community and other young adolescents. And like you said, um, Mayor Brown, that the adolescents are the next generation. They are super important to the community. And if other kids can see this that are done by other kids, it can mean a lot to them too, to feel connected and to be reminded that they are loved and they're also just humans at the end of the day. All right. Any questions? Comment? Just a comment. Just yes. I think mm -hmm. it, I think it, I love it, mm -hmm. and I love um, I actually like the idea because I know up in the, up in the Capitol building you'll see different displays now and again, and so I, I like the idea of uh, using that space like that. So sounds great. Well, I think we just had the great project with our banners through the school district to put out throughout our city with the artist and going through that. So I just thought this was a great next step. And obviously, this is something that, you know, we'll, we say temporary, but obviously it depends how long temporary means that we're in this building for the future. But it is something that can be taken down 
also and moved at the right time if it's if it's deemed or something even better to be to come forward so we appreciate you taking that effort and uh, really helping and being a college student you know that shows a lot of initiative and, and we appreciate that thank you well, well done yeah. thank you. very nice thank so the chair will entertain a motion to approve this uh, I'll make a motion uh, to approve the temporary public art display in City Hall. I'll second. All right, and Ms. Moore, to the second. All right, any other discussion? I'll just, may I note? Yes. Um, that I love it. I love yeah. the project, and I love that uh, you had the foresight to come and, and make it a more public display for the community. Uh, personally, I, I feel like it speaks to all the different hats that we wear, um, which collectively is, I think, the core of our humanness. So I think they did an excellent job. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 5. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Three. I am voting yes. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and Good four. Yes. Carries five to zero, and how quick can we get it up? So We will be working with the CRA and right. the facilities team. Uh, there's a challenge to, to putting it up right, because I of know. the size of it, right. and we'll probably have to do it maybe after hours, and there'll probably be lifts involved and right. other things, and we'll be seeking CRA uh, support for that. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. You want to get a picture? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. Yep, let's go. We'll get a picture. Yeah. Why don't you want us to get up here and then like, hold the. Can I say okay. hold that? Yeah. Um, also, one more thing. I would like to exceed, exceed, exceed a um, invitation for all of you guys to be invited to New College of Florida Art Thesis Opening Night. And this mural also will be displayed there along with the, um, another mural that I did in the gallery. So I hope you guys can come in the opening reception night. And I'll hand out postcards once um, this meeting is done. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. If, if you guys can come up here, face the cameras, and if like anyone else in your group come up, that'd be fine. Come on. Come on. Get the ball. <laughs> Let's get the band together. Get in come on. Too. You get in it too. We'll get you the picture. We'll get you the picture. Does anybody got hold, hold, hold the hold the uh, piece of paper. Yeah, we need the piece of paper so you can have your depiction. Your awesome work. Everybody in? Mm -hmm. See everybody? Yeah. David's great at <laughs> dropping. Great job. Good, thank you guys. Yeah. Mayor, that will conclude my uh, item number nine of new business at the present time. I stand for any questions if anybody has any. Is there any unfinished business? Uh, none at this time. All right, so we'll move to council reports and we'll start in Ward 2. Oh, well, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, sir, I, I want to thank everyone that came together and worked so hard for the program at Lewis Park last weekend. I received a lot of information, a lot of positive comments about how wonderful the park is and how terrific it's going to be for some of the younger kids to be able to do uh, t-ball there and the the neighborhood is just very happy that we put the time the effort uh, and the money into that park and i want to thank uh, the, all of the members of the city council for supporting that it, it's a it's a wonderful wonderful park and then i have one more thing and and tamara's going to or ms melton's going to help me with this Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. Aww. <laughs> Perfect. For those of you that remember when I first got on the city council and Matthew Barnaby was a second grader at mm -hmm. Miller Elementary, please allow me the honor of introducing to you Mr. and Mrs. Matthew Patrick Barnaby. My son got married <laughs> about a week ago. So, Congratulations. Was, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. 
And that concludes my report. All right, I'll just jump on a little bit with Lewis Park and, and Sean Flynn, and he's president of Manatee West Little League right now. And obviously we have a great park in GT Bray Park, uh, but it's a little bit for the bigger kids. These are the four and five year old T-ballers. And if you looked out there, you know, it was fun. Pouring down rain, nobody cared at that moment on Saturday. But what um, Ross and his staff and Brian and his staff did, you know, as far as waste and everybody over at the Public Works and Sanitation that, you know, is keeping that park looking good. We do have one problem at the park now. We got to empty the garbage cans a lot more, mm -hmm. which is a good problem to have because that means that people are using it. And we are getting numerous positive feedback on that when we, at the beginning, people were, were concerned. And I think they realized that some of the things that that were done have now benefited the park. And now with the Little League jumping in, and that's their official Little League field for the T-ballers. The you know, and, and we didn't have to cut any trees down. We trimmed up the little tree, but not to any detriment to it because T-ballers are basically infield, you know, when they hit the ball and, and go. But that's something great, and I think that that's something that will be coming back, you know, as some other improvements to that park and other parks. I do have somebody that's contacted me that said find them another park in the city that we can do that to and they would help fund it. So, um, you know, private person. So let's, that's, you don't give me a challenge like that and I'm not going to take advantage and bring it here. So um, I know Ross is thinking, oh no, more, more work. But, but I think that if we can do another park in our city that matches that park, because even though it's a true neighborhood park, we have the true neighborhood on the river walk and the different things in Mineral Springs area, but let's continue to grow that because when we were out there the other day doing some logistical things with the contractors, um, I think there was almost 70 people there in, in there with their children. And it was before spring break. I would expect to go out there now on spring break and it'd even be busier. So that's a good problem to have and, you know, benches and different things that, you know, we're working to keep improving it. So. Obviously, without the rotary, it wouldn't have been able to be done in that way, but also without all our city staff and this council extending the additional monies that we put in there. So great job. To kudos to everybody. Thanks, Mayor. And I don't mean to interrupt, but I'd like to thank you for going out there and kicking off the T-ball season out there on Saturday. I saw the pictures this morning, and yeah. uh, the T-ball the teams had their own mascot. Oh, yeah. Never seen it. I was expecting you to probably have be the person under it, but right. that was someone no, else. It was, <laughs> there was over 100 people there by yeah, the time the day was like out. And me. as Vice Mayor Barnaby said, she was getting a text or a phone message from somebody and uh, forwarded it to me that, wow, great job, and how it's continued to grow. So we'll keep working that. Um, moving on, Council um, or Ward 3. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm very happy to see Connor up here. Uh, but as I scanned the audience, I saw some people that just were smiling the entire time. And I got a feel that these are Connor's parents right down here. <laughs> you know, we don't get a lot of people smiling at us very often. <laughs> and, uh, they were smiling the entire, every time I glanced out towards the audience, they were smiling the entire time. They Doug Hoffman's they also smiling. At us. They were just smiling, right? Right, Doug Hoffman's just laughing at us, but, um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but thank you very much for your donation that got him up here. And uh, that's it. All right. Thank you. Fort, Miss Moore. Um, I, um, I just want to applaud. I, that's such exciting news uh, that there might be, you know, a, as an individual that wants to invest in more city parks. Um, I have to give kudos to you all pre me because I was not on the council, I think, when you began the Lewis Park, uh, Park project, but it really encourages me that we can, you know, make those kind of things happen because I do think it's a fantastic addition to the, to the city. Um, I don't have much else other than I am going to be attending uh, a fashion tea with my River Isle ladies this afternoon that I look forward to that. Um, and I think that's just about it. I don't have a whole lot today. Need a hat? Let me know. I know. Oh. Hats like that. Hats like it's, that. true. I forgot a hat. <laughs> it shows, I think, the, the public interest and public-private partnerships that this council and, and, and my office is really working towards. 
And it can be government, public, public partnerships, public, private, but as we know, we can't do it all ourselves. And we can do it a lot better in collaboration. And that's, that's always been a theme. And I, and I thank this council for continuing that theme with what we're doing and the community letting us do that. So that's awesome. a perfect thing. So, all right, Ward 5. All right, Ward 5 is alive. Uh, just a few things I had noted from the very start of our meeting. We've had some, some presentations and, and, and recognition. Um, first of all, with the water quality, that was great to have that information and get that out to the public. And secondly, the, the Child Abuse Association. I get to see the, the I get to see them working. You know, um, a lot of times those calls are made from my school and I, I, I see the benefits of their labor. So it was really great to see them being recognized and appreciated. Um, during citizen comments, when the mother came up and spoke about her son, of course, that is definitely something this city and our law enforcement and all those involved in such a thing are um, caring and, and will definitely do as all we can to help that mother with her grief. You know, it's only so much, but, but we are a friendly city and I, I have faith, I know that we'll do the right thing and take care of it. We've already done the right thing. Um, on the vein of parks, <laughs> one of the things I am most proud of in, in the, my almost immediate neighborhood is that we are going to redesign one of the, well, both parks, but we're gonna start with Love Park. And that has been, <laughs> the source of complaints for, for you know, safety reasons and, and usability and all of that. So I'm pretty excited that the signs have been put up, letting the neighborhood know that uh, a new park is coming. And uh, so far, I've only heard good comments. It's more like, thank you, time, you know? It hasn't been used as a park the way it has been designed for years. So the idea of something new coming and something that can be used and something that will be safe, uh, there are quite a few people uh, looking forward to that. There are a few that aren't happy <laughs> that it'll be closed for a bit, but that's okay because they can move on. <laughs> uh, and, and also in the vein of safety, when Chief was you know bringing up about the fire station and you know, I'm kind of concerned about when, when we try to cut things so it'll fit with that, you know, that cost, hopefully, and I feel confident that we've not, you know, uh, in any way diminished quality, just kind of took a few little, little luxuries, I guess, out of the way. Uh, but that brings me also to think, on that east side, there is still some areas over near an apartment complex where uh, the residents that don't have the proper, I guess, decals or what have you, are parking along the side of the street and it's really becoming a bit of a nuisance or has been a nuisance for people to be able to get through. I have to double check and find out where we are with that, but I did, uh, about a week ago, someone mentioned that it was still kind of going on. And we had a city vehicle, I don't think it was an emergency vehicle, was unable to get past on that street, I think it was the, the street sweeper or something, and there was a call made, I thought. But anyway, just saying that we want to definitely make sure those streets are clear so that you can get to them and, and respond to them um, readily. And on a positive, positive, positive note, I am so appreciative to how our mayor made a young lady's wish beyond wishes come true. There's a young lady in my neighborhood. She's, she's killing it in softball. Her dad is very supportive. He's with her, you know, all the time and making sure she gets to practices and does her schoolwork and all that stuff. But one of the things she wanted was to go to a game, a baseball game. I mean, you can hear Lee Calm, 
from her home. I can hear it too. Um, and it just so happened, I happened to uh, see a post on Facebook. I hardly pay attention, but uh, you know, I saw some pictures of her and her baseball, uh, softball game, and her dad was so proud. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, how would, would you like tickets to go to the game? And he said, she had just recently asked him, gee, dad, could we go to a game? So those tickets came available and it was spring break on Monday. I'm sorry. <laughs> Monday was spring break, so it was perfect. That one o'clock game was perfect. So they got my tickets. And uh, they got the tickets, rather. And I mentioned to the mayor, I said, hey, there's going to be a young lady and her father sitting in the seats. Uh, and it meant so much to the father, Mr. Williams, that you personally came down to meet him and bring them up to the box. And he, he was so amazed that the mayor would come and get, you know, just a regular person and his daughter and bring them up and, and give them, you know, like the royal treatment, which uh, she'll never forget it. She will never forget it and neither will he. He is definitely your greatest fan. He did say, I'm, I'm one too, but, <laughs> but um, I just thank you for, it's obvious how you feel about the youth and, um, I just want to thank you personally for how you um, took care of that little girl and her dad and really made, I can't even tell you, that that's going to go far. And uh, other than that, Award 5 is alive. If you celebrate Easter, hope the Easter Bunny is kind to you, get something real pretty to wear and all of that stuff. You need a hat. Uh, Oh, 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 you know, I, I inherited my mom's hat, so I got you covered. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ward 1. Yeah, um, just to kind of play off of that, I mean, we are very blessed in the city. Um, I mean, the mayor does stuff like that constantly, it seems like, and even, I'm going to tell a tale on you, that he was out weed whacking, <laughs> out on Ninth Street, he and Gina, doing just doing that extra to just put it forward for our city. And I don't know that everybody appreciates all that you do for us. And I, I wanted to give you a little shout out too. But um, I uh, want to thank the Pittsburgh Pirates. I'm you know, spring training um, is such a magical time of the year, and it was um, it was a great year. I think I was able to go to a couple of games, and I want to thank them. They're they're great supporters of our city. And uh, I, look, I look forward to them coming back again next year. And uh, we are kicking off the Marauders. I think it's this Friday, isn't April it? 5th. April 5th. April 5th. Um, so there will be plenty more baseball games. Um, and uh, while we were disappointed that the music in the park didn't happen because of the rain, um, that will be happening this Friday. Um, it is, the band is Solar Coaster. It says it's a rock band, and that will be from 6 to 8. Those are always a lot of fun. The community comes out, free music. Um, I really, I always enjoy that. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Tomasco. Um, that, you know, we know that there are a lot of voices out there. And while everybody's got well-meaning, um, it's great to have that scientific data to rely on. Um, so I want to thank him for taking the time to come here and actually for doing such a great job on the, the estuary board in general. Um, so I, I thank him for that. And then uh, I just want to wish everyone a, a blessed Holy Week and, and a happy Easter. Thank you. All right, staying on the theme of the Pirates. So the games that we had this year, the weather could not have been any better. We had Chamber of Commerce weather the whole uh, home game season for us. So, you know, we just uh, we got a little bit lucky. A lot of times people say the mayor – don't let it rain today, but I don't really have that much control of things, but <laughs> we're trying. But no, just, um, and we're waiting for the final numbers, but I believe we're going to top 95,000 throughout the spring. So that's mm -hmm. some numbers that, you know, before COVID were happening a little bit, but since COVID, it, the difference. But now we saw that, that those numbers are back, and that economic impact in our city is great. 
Now, the other, or the other impact is traffic, and that's one of the things that, that our police department really looked through, um, and we actually had officers on streets. You go to Tampa Bucks game, you go to a Lightning game, you had a different. They direct the traffic, so we're looking at that, and this year was a little bit of a sample that we did, so our police department did a great job of getting out there, trying to move that traffic out of there. Um, since Major League Baseball has put the speed clock in where batting and pitching and all of that, the games get over a little earlier, which we like, because it gets out before the, the rush hour traffic. <coughs> so it's going to be something that, that I think we can morph into next year and have it better, um, which will really help. And also, uh, we've met with DOT, um, the MPO, and different with, uh, I think we just hired a traffic engineer, which is going to help us. We're working with the county, doing some of those things that are are looking at ways because a lot of times, it, you know, lights being synced don't always change the flow of the traffic because we have two one-way streets in Manatee Avenue and 6th Avenue, but they're very close together. So if people are trying to turn to get over the Green Bridge, there's not a lot. One way has to stop for a long time to get it. So those things are being looked at. You know, there's a lot of posts out there that, that they're not. They're looked at constantly. One of the things to remember is don't block the box and don't turn from a center lane when it's a straight lane because we are going to work on those and, and we do not want to give out tickets, but we want people to abide by the rules. And if you block the box, you actually could slow the traffic up by a considerable amount of time. So really pay attention. Our public works is working on that right now to more signage and putting some of those white boxes just so it helps you a little bit that way. And then um, there's some comments coming in at some of the different wards. We're getting um, a lot of comments about speed humps. Well, obviously, we know why we don't do speed humps. We have our own fire department, and that's something that they have stood strong on for years. So I'm going to ask, and I wanted to do this in the public meeting, that um, some areas that they talk about speed humps, it's because of the speed. Well, is there a way to maybe put some four-way stops? that, and, you know, right now, that will slow the traffic down. I don't know, but I'm going to ask our police department to research that and come up with some of the areas that they've talked about, which a lot of times it's the neighbors that get affected by that the most, but if it's safety, then it might be worth it because a lot of our, I'm just going to say Riverview Boulevard, for example, from 26th Street West, people are saying that's a speed track. Well, speed hump might slow it a little, but a four-way stop would definitely slow it unless they're running the stop sign, which then there'd be more penalty. So I don't know. I don't have the answer for that, but I just thought that's something that the public can look at and say, hey, we're at least looking and trying things. So, Mr. Mayor, if, yes, I, could, if I could just add yes. something there, because I know that there's been a couple of neighborhoods in Ward 2 that have asked about speed humps, speed tables, speed bumps. Some of the newer neighborhoods do not have curbing. They have a, a swale that helps take the water the storm water off of the street. We know, we have seen out in the county, if you don't have a curb and you put a speed bump in, people will go up into people's yards to go around the speed hump. So that's why in many instances, I, I just tell the neighborhoods, it's, it's gonna cause you more trouble than it's worth because you, it, people do go around and they go up in people's yards to go around them. But it, you're not being ignored by us. We're, no. we're looking at every option out there and trying to figure out. Yes, yes, ma'am. And I think once we were talking about, um, for example, on some streets around where I am, if there were speed limit signs up, they're not now. So sometimes even just a matter of putting them up and reminding people, uh, this is a neighborhood, you don't go 40, 50 miles per hour, yeah. 25, you know. So I think just a reminder, too, if we could get some signs up. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, um, I think to, to some extent, um, I think traffic mitigation would help that because I think if people felt that they were in, in a flow versus just at a standstill, they wouldn't mind that the speed limit was, you know, only 25 or 30 miles an hour. So I think that projects like, um, just to give Miss uh, Clayback a shout out, a uh, project that she is working on that I am super excited about, which is the total streetscape of 2nd Avenue making that pedestrian and, and cyclists safe 
will help with that feeling of flow, but not driving super fast. So I think. We and I think when you go down places. second, there is some stop signs mm -hmm. in places where if there was no stop signs, it, it would, would just, just be a right. racetrack. So that would be some options. So. Well, as you pointed out, I mean, we have traffic engineers, so we yeah. Can, yeah. Now we can, <laughs> yeah. Very exciting. Yeah, we can kind of dedicate a little bit more resources more for to some that, of these so. issues. Perfect. <clears throat> All right. All right. Uh, nothing else on my report. Uh, department heads, chief. I'm glad you all are talking so much about traffic because um, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. But before I do that, I just want to reassure you I had a very positive um, discussion with Miss Washington out in the hallway. So um, I wanted to let you know these are the things we don't always or I don't always come in here and, and kind of wave the flag. Um, recently, last week, we um, received a, a hard fought grant. Um, it was part of um, my participation in the Public Safety Coordinating Council. We get 250,000 in JAG funding each year and it's up to the, the chiefs and the sheriff and um, various nonprofit groups to try to get a little piece of that. Um, we actually got $12,000 for um, a 9,000 intoxilizer. Um, we used to have an intoxilizer before I arrived, but um, space constraints and the requirements that go along with that force that out. Um, this takes about six months to nine months to get the funding, and so we're, oh, I'm sorry, uh, DUI, DUI enforcement. Um, we do D DUI enforcement, but currently, if we pull somebody over, determine that they're impaired, and arrest them, we have to drive all the way out to the county jail to um, do that test. That can be problems, prob that can be problematic for a variety of reasons, I'm sure you know. Um, we're uh, excited about actually having this and have that part of our new police station. Um, it can actually help us maybe put somebody permanently on that job, something that I know that the community has been calling for a long time. We also got another $12,000 for speed lasers. Um, we're trying to get more and more out there. I think you all have probably seen a lot of the signs that are popping up in, in various places, and so we've really aggressively gone after grants. Just this year alone, um, with that 25000 that will make $100,000 that the police department has obtained in grants, everything from speed um, to DUI to pedestrian and bicycle safety. You may see right now, if you guys have been out and about, we are aggressively out there working those grants. Um, it's not our desire to, to be punitive to the point where we affect somebody's pocketbook, but unfortunately, um, just what we're seeing out there and, and aggressive driving, um, you know, it is making a difference, we feel. And so um, just so I'd let you know that um, crime reduction team is, has been out there. Um, I don't know if you all have seen them in the neighborhoods and, yep. and downtown, whatnot. I can see the difference. I'm reading their nightly reports. They're out there doing some, some pretty good things. So stay tuned on that. Speaking of the pirates, if you all didn't catch it, uh, we retired. Yeah. For the second time, <laughs> Officer uh, McGowan, who he was done, right? He was he was probably done about halfway <laughs> halfway through the season, but his dog kept wanting to come back to get the hot dog from me. <laughs> well, he had to get game. there. He had to get there at four o'clock in the morning, so yeah, he, being retired he and then get getting there. up and checking the stadium at four uh, was um, kind of like eh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. But he <laughs> he, he hung on this year game. for you for me. Right. Um, but he's over, uh, or he's happy, he was in yesterday. They're getting ready to go vacation together. Um, we are actually in the process right now of replacing him. We're, we're gonna shift a little bit. We're gonna go from floppy ear to pointy ear um, so that we can get a little bit more bang for our buck. Because really, truly, which is a good thing for our city, um, he doesn't do much else except for the, the Pirates games and some big events around the region. So. Um, we're looking at some different options, and, and the good news about that is that we receive um, grant well, grant funding from um, you know some various entities to help support that, so it doesn't come out of our um, our budget. And then finally, if you all haven't had an opportunity to see the work of some of my staff out front of the police department. Mm -hmm. um, that's an important area for us. I know you and I have talked about it. It's, it's a safe haven. Um, we, we see it used quite often for all kinds of exchanges, um, you know, marketplace, what have you, kid exchanges. But this time of year, what we love to see, and I can see it out my window, 
are the dozens and dozens of people from around the community who come there to take pictures, mm -hmm. their family pictures. If you guys haven't seen it, um, Marvin and um, Josie went out of their way. I was trying to figure out what they were doing after hours in the back building flower boxes. Um, and so please make it a point to get out there, maybe take a picture um, and enjoy that and encourage folks to come by. I think it's a really good connection when they're out there snapping family photos and the police officers are coming back and forth. I think, I think that's just a, a pretty cool thing. So that's all I have. Thank Chief, you. I have one question for you. Um, you mentioned about the public-private partnership with helping with securing our next uh, dog animal. Uh, mention those names who does that. I think that's that's appropriate because it's community support and it is the public-private partnership. Um, so for for many years now, um, it's twofold. Uh, the Pirates organization um, pays for half of it, and NDC pays for another half. And it's this is actually going to be their second dog. Um, as well, both those entities, and a lot of people don't know that, also help support our Officer of the Quarter um, initiative uh, to provide some um, little goodies in a bag for the officers who are recognized. Speaking of that, um, hopefully you've gotten the invite. You'll be getting it today, just in case you didn't, for our annual awards ceremony that's coming up, I believe, on April 10th. That's um, something that is sponsored by Just Jewelers. Um, uh, as well as O'Bricks um, and Corks. Um, these are all businesses who have stepped forward. They don't want anything from us. Um, and, and it's simply to acknowledge the great work that the men and women of the Brainton Police Department are doing and, and to help us in <coughs> any way we can. We've got some fantastic opportunities. And um, Councilman Kramer, I know you sit on the Brainton Blue Foundation um, coming up in just the next two weeks, um, I, you know, you run into people um, over across the street from my house at the American Legion. They've been giving um, bears and money to the to the sheriff's office for years, and I said, "Well, I'm better looking than the sheriff, and you know, maybe they're in the county, but I, I don't know how I convinced them. Um, but they're actually getting ready to do a a bear and poker run on." the 12th, I think, and they're gonna donate those proceeds um, to the foundation. Right. And as you guys know, that money goes towards officer wellness, equipment, it's bought our officers the plate, armored plates for their vest. Um, it helps with community events, and so it really does a, is, does a lot for us. We also are gonna be the recipients of a golf tournament um, just through a relationship that's gonna be happening out in Palm Harbor. Um, it benefits um, autism education, which we do every year, um, but uh, the proceeds from that, which is going to happen on the 6th, should be in the realm of about $18,000. That's going to go to our, our foundation. Um, and so we've already earmarked that for potentially some new gym equipment for the, for the new station um, to help out in, in that regard. And so it's incredible, uh, really, how we've grown that and, and how the community has come to us to, to, to try to help. Um, it, it makes it very acutely aware to us how much they care about us and I think they realize how much we care about them. And as a final reminder, our torch run, law enforcement torch run, which has nothing to do with us, but um, Special Olympics is the number one entity that law enforcement um, really gives back to and um, endorses and so we're going to be out there with our special olympians uh, saturday morning on april 6 um, for a 5k and so anybody interested in signing up i'll just make sure you all get sent that link as well and if you don't want to sign up maybe you can buy a shirt or maybe you can just donate um, you know it's they need help and um, it's it's always a great event we we do that in cooperation with the manti county sheriff's office i i don't run 5ks anymore my knees don't like that but I know you got three cheerleaders up here, so if you need to stand in the corners. We'll, we'll be out there. I, I think it's at like 8.45 or something in the morning. I don't really run, but I walk. Um, I, get, I get through it one way or the other. So um, anyway, so thank you. All right, and then last thing, just as obviously our prayers go out to the New York family of police department. You saw that on the news this morning where one of their officers was shot and, and killed, had a small child and, and obviously a wife. So. I'm sure there's a lot of things in this country, but our police officers 
that put their lives on the line every day. You just think, keep that family. And then um, also the, the community of Baltimore, you know, we lived that 40 years ago with the Skyway mm -hmm. and they're living something now. And, and, you know, you think about the, the six or seven people that they're identified that they can't find yet, that those families and, and their, our prayers are with them, especially at this Easter time when you're going through things and, and you're celebrating what Easter means. And that's such a tragedy there. And, and for that community, um, I was in seventh grade when the Skyway got hit and one of my teachers coming to the school was on the bridge, was fortunate enough to stop before the part that fell. So I, I, you know, we were wondering where she was and nobody knew and then somebody said she came over the Skyway and then that came up. So, you know, that sticks always in my heart because we were waiting for our teacher to get there and mm -hmm. fortunately we were able to, she was able to get stopped before the, the others. But um, any other department heads? All right, before we adjourn, or before Mayor Longo adjourns, we want to give a couple things here. This is one of our keys to the city. So you can stand up, we'll give it to you there. Um, doesn't open anything, but it's a key to the city. So. Mayor, can we, can we get a picture with his parents down front and maybe all the council in the back? Yeah. Well, and concluded on a great note like that. And I'd also like to thank uh, Ms. Arguella for coming, filling in for Mr. Rudisell this morning. And happy belated birthday to Mr. Perry. Girl, you know it's your birthday too. Don't, don't even ask. It's a big number. Yeah. It's, it's a big number. I don't like to tell you that. But it is the 25th, right? It is the 25th, yeah. How old it was. <laughs> So we get in, uh, it's just a certificate of achievement, and obviously we appreciate the family being willing to, to donate money to St. Joseph's Catholic Church to buy this. So, you know, it's really it's a thank, and uh, so you get to keep this certificate, show your friends, hang it on your wall, keep it. I've got certificates I got 45, 50 years ago from the Boys and Girls Club that I love it, so it means something, but I don't have a key to the city. So here's that for you. So congratulations, and we appreciate you being here. That's what I was going to say. We're right there. Yeah. Yeah. Girl, I was going to say, we're adjourned. We're adjourned.